Hello, everyone. My name is Memo. And today, oopsie. And today, I'm going to tell you the journey I've been doing together with my friend, colleague, and artist, Maria Pinel Kobo, and how we've been doing bacterial art. And the point of all this is to merge uh, the gap, the artificial gap between science and art, and to lower the disgust level that public have towards bacteria. And there's going to be three parts to this talk. First, I'm going to talk about bacteria in general, and then how we use bacteria to make art. And at the end, I'll talk about our future dreams of what we'd like to do. So why am I interested in doing art with living bacteria? The obvious answer is bacteria are amazing, and they're amazing for many, many reasons. And we really want to bridge that gap that's between science and art. And uh, we want to bridge that gap using the universal language of art. So why are bacteria amazing? Why are they so fantastic? First of all, they're incredibly ancient. They're one of the first living forms on this planet. If you look at the history of our planet from the birth about four and a half billion years ago today, as soon as there was water in the first, uh, half, first 500 million years, there was immediately life. So life began very quickly on this planet as soon as there was water. And life began with bacteria and they've been dominating life ever since. So the oldest evidence that bacteria live is in Australia in the stromatolites. They're about three and a half billion years old. And these fossilized rocks are actually made of biological material that are, when you look at them, they're all made out of bacteria. And when you compare that to multicellular uh, creatures, so the first evidence of a multicellular creature was about 650 million years ago, you can kind of understand how old they are. And life began multicellularly with these jelly-like, soft, spongy-like things. But before that, for billions of years, the planet was engineered and made by bacteria. And if you look inside those stromatolites, you can actually see the air bubbles that, uh, that the bacteria were making, so the beginning of oxygen on this planet. And just to give you an idea of what a three and a half billion years looks like, this picture you're seeing is about 350 million years of rock. So you have to go really deep on Earth if that was the scale to understand what three and a half billion years is. An origin of life began with bacteria for billions of years, and only you know one billion years ago or so did archaea and eukaryotes and more modern cellular structures appear. And they're also huge. So what I mean by that is, if you look at the size of bacteria, here's the tip of a needle. So if you take a needle and you look at the tip of it. These yellow dots are actual bacteria at the tip of the needle. So they're incredibly small, you would think. But if you're an alien looking at the planet from outer uh, space and you ask, is there life? You, you would see the green trees as evidence of life. But then you would see these microbial uh, blooms in oceans too from outer space. So they're one of the few creatures that can be actually seen from outer space. Here, like uh, um, uh, the size of Ireland and the tip of uh, Italy, or here you have Denmark, Norway, Scotland, and you could see how big they're as big as a country, and they can be seen from outer space. They're also incredibly diverse. So if you sequenced all the DNA on this planet, majority of the DNA would be microbial in origin, and animals and eukaryotes and archaea would be a very small part of the diversity of genetic information on this planet. So majority of the life on this planet is bacteria, and when you then convert these facts to numbers, you get some crazy numbers. So for example, that's estimated, no one can count, but there are about 10 to the 30 microbial cells on this planet. And that number is just gigantic. Just, just to give you a comparison, it pales to the number of stars that are observable universe or in our galaxy. And if you look at the weight of bacteria, if you dried all the oceans and looked at what's the biological material in all the oceans, 90% of it is bacteria. And half the total weight of all the living creatures on this planet is bacteria. And they have basically geoengineered this planet. Uh, the carbon cycle, sulfur, nitrogen, these cycles, majority of that occurs through bacteria in, in case of nitrogen, almost all of it. And half the oxygen that we breathe on this planet is again made by bacteria. And, you know, we're always worried about nuclear warfare and the world going to end with apocalyptic nuclear bombs. That would not be the case for bacteria. 
if the sun was completely blocked and we went into pure uh, nuclear winter, life on this earth would have no problem surviving because bacteria can, are one of the few creatures that can live independent of the sun. So if you go deep down in the ocean to these thermal vents where volcanic minerals are coming out, you see a whole life form around it and it begins with bacteria converting that chemical energy to biological energy. So because of their amazing diversity, they're everywhere. There's not a sterile place on this planet that you cannot find bacteria. You'll find them in extremely acidic or alkaline conditions, in extremely salty conditions, and even in temperatures above 100 degrees. So basically they're everywhere. And they can breathe into rocks. They don't even need oxygen. So we breathe uh, uh, in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide, and they put their electron into rocks. Um, if you go look at the dust particles three kilometers up in the air, you'll find that there are bacteria and they can fly around the planet without even touching the globe for months. And if you go to the deepest part of the planet and look at the rocks five kilometers below in South Africa, you'll again find uh, bacteria inside those rocks. And wherever there's life, there's bacteria. So the bacteria could be anywhere on this uh, universe where there's water. And there's strong hope uh, that Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, which has believes to have liquid uh, water, most likely has bacteria living inside that planet. And there are missions now to look for it. So this all amazing facts about bacteria also make them really important that we really have to be engaging with bacteria. We have to be uh, aware of them and we have to almost eat them. And uh, you have to go outside to do that. And one fact that always kills me is that prisoners by law have to be one and a half hours every day outside. And a lot of us don't even have that much time to be outside every day. So this awareness is slowly catching up and many countries are now banning antimicrobial soaps and material. I think uh, Denmark banned it and their MRSA counts started going down. So bacteria are really important. And on us, there's lots of bacteria, as you could imagine, on various spots. And it is said that uh, the weight of your leg from your knee down is about equivalent to how much bacteria is on you. And that always changes, of course, when you go to the toilet. So there's now a lot of evidence linking microbes to our health. For example, one study took uh, fecal matter from patients with um, uh, health issues with their mind and they found that those people who have autism spectrum have different microbes than those people that don't. Um, there's now strong links between people suffering from major depression to the kind of bacteria they have in their guts. And uh, they showed one study is they took people who ran the marathon. And you can see here the dotted line is where they run the marathon. And pre-marathon, post-marathon, their bacterial gut changed a lot. So when you do a lot of exercise, your bacteria has changed in your guts. And this being uh, Boston, the study was in Boston, they immediately now made a company out of it. And now you can buy a microbiome from athletes' guts. And with all this importance of bacteria that most scientists are aware, of, the public is not so much aware of it, not due to lack of knowledge, but mostly because we're very visual creatures. We believe in things we see, and we don't much care about things we don't see. So what is life on this planet? Well, it comes from you know, viruses all the way to blue whales, and it starts very small to very large scale, but our eyes perceive only a very narrow spectrum of life on this planet. And what we don't see, uh, we don't believe or we don't care, but we do sometimes see bacteria in our daily activities. And usually that's in the case of rotting. So when things go bad or rot, we're like, ah, there's bacteria and fungus on our life. We only see it in terms of rot. And when do we hear in public what bacteria do? The media tells us what bacteria do only as a scare. There is an outbreak, there is listeria, E. coli, the lettuces, the cucumbers, right? You never hear about the great things that they do or nor does it make news. And that results in this kind of fear of bacteria that if we have bacteria or, or have dirt, we're gonna die, right? But with, what bacteria do really kill us? So if we look at the deaths on this planet caused by bacteria, there's about 22 species of bacteria that kill us. And there are millions and millions of other different species 
that are very important for our health and for our global health. So one solution to this is we need to see bacteria and so we could get more comfortable with that. And one of my heroes, George Laforge from Star Trek, he had this cool visor that could see all spectrums of energy. So he could look at many different ways of looking at life. And I've always wanted to wear that glasses. And that inspired us to do a little experiment, the kiss. It's a romantic gesture that we all love doing, but what if we could see the bacteria involved in a kiss? So Maria did that and she kissed an agar plate and all these bacteria grew. And I read somewhere that about 15 million bacteria are exchanged between people who kiss with their lips. So we need to bring the invisible to the visible. We need to see this bacteria and be comfortable with them. And that brings me to uh, the bacterial art. But I also want to talk about uh, briefly about the gap between science and art, not just bacteria, because I think that has a lot to do with it. And I've been pondering, why do we have the fields of art and science separately? And in my humble opinion, there are two major causes of that. One is the birth of thought with Aristoteles, where he came up with this new concept called, uh, called matter, right? That everything is made out of matter. He came up with that concept to shut the sophists who didn't believe in everything. They just believed that the world is according to their opinion. So to shut up the sophists, he came up with the concept of matter. And what that means is that things are made out of matter, things that you can measure are made out of matter, and things that you cannot measure that are not made out of matter are not real. So that really started a separation between science and art. But that was kind of a philosophical debate until industrial revolution came along. And factories said, we don't want schools and universities to educate in arts, literature, poetry. We need people to design pipes for us, pressure, electricity, and gauges, and engineers. So education changed drastically. For example, beans and high-level educators were, uh, were literary people, were poets. They used to be the deans of universities, and now it's physicists and ele electricians. So that kind of began, these two processes began a little crack in our reality, but over time, that crack turned into a giant canyon. So right now, if you go to any university campus over there, you'll have the schools of arts and literature, and over there, you'll have the schools of natural sciences, and they will hardly talk to each other. And when they do, it's a cute collaborative project, not in depth. The scientists are not actually in the lab doing art, and the artists are not in their studios doing science. So this huge gap has to be closed. And there are examples of uh, art and science coming together. So I've been looking into the oldest forms of art, and that's about 65,000 years ago in Spain, where these Neanderthals were just smearing paint on these rock structures, and it's obviously not for practical purposes. What it was for is not known, but around in Indonesia, you can see the birth of real art about 40,000 years ago. And we see depictions of scientific literature and knowledge through the use of art, but really that is not an exact collaboration in my opinion. So one great example is how we visualize proteins. In the beginning, when we started studying protein structures, they showed it as wires because it's a string, but those wires were not very informative and they were not easy to look at. And Jane Richardson, a great protein scientist, she came up with drawing alpha helices and beta strands of protein, which are not true. They are not helices or strands, but it really helps us visualize truth. And she said she came up with that concept after seeing Escher's peel the apple face artwork. So there's always inspiration by scientists using art, but there's no real serious collaboration. But I also have to emphasize that science and art are not exactly the same. There are some differences. And one of the big differences is this. This is how art begins, right? The first poem you're gonna write, the song you're gonna sing, or the drawing you're gonna make, it begins with a blank slate. You have no information. Whereas in science, you always have pre previous data that you follow. Hardly do we begin with a blank slate and go, okay, I'm gonna discover something. So there are some subtle differences but I don't think the gap is that big. And all these things were going in my head uh, for throughout my life. I am a, I'm actually a pretty talented artist. I always found that studying science without art was a forced divorce for me. I wanted to do both. And when I had my own lab, I started doing bacterial art drawing with my uh, bacteria. 
But then I realized that if you really want to do something good, you really have to dedicate yourself to it. You can't do anything well as a side hobby. And these things were going on in my head about exactly about 11 years ago, when I was at a restaurant in Beverly, Massachusetts, where I saw the artwork of Maria on the walls of this restaurant. And I asked if I could meet her and thus began our journey. So a bit of brief about Maria. Maria, she grew up in this beautiful town, San Vicente de la Barquera in Northern Cantabria in Spain. And in her little town growing up, she was constantly surrounded by beautiful patterns of nature. It really influenced her thinking. She saw beautiful shapes naturally occurring without the intervention of an artist. And it looked like pieces of art wherever she looked. So that brought her to the art world and she started studying art in Madrid using natural substances. So this is a cocoon that you see on the right that you could actually crawl into as an insect. And she was using natural substances to make all sorts of art that kind of was reflecting her childhood images of the nature and beauty. And so she started learning how to do wood carvings. And those wood carvings were very similar to the patterns that I see when I do science. And I was like, this is exactly the artist that I want to collaborate with. And when I saw her wood carvings, it really reminded me of the microscopic images I see daily in my research. So I invited her to come to New England Biolabs where I conduct research. And New England Biolabs is a biotechnology company where we make enzymes, but it also really promotes art. It's a beautiful campus. And there I showed her bacteria in its natural form. And immediately she was in love with bacteria and she began to volunteer her time in my lab and we started working with bacteria. And thus began our collaboration where in this picture, she's the scientist and I'm the artist in trying to kind of challenge the uh, model vision we have of scientists and artists. So I taught her how to do, how to manipulate bacteria, how to conduct uh, safe, sterile forms. And it's not that complicated. And the laboratory became her new studio. She learned how to work sterilely and manipulate and understand bacteria more and more. It wasn't easy. It took months and years. But finally, she let go of her uh, uh, paintbrush and took up, took up the loop. And this is our palette. And I always get asked, what are the bacteria that you use? So we used to have contaminations in our experiments and we threw them away. We don't use the word contamination anymore. We use guests that appeared in our experiments. And some of them have color and we identify what kind of bacteria they are and we use them. So they're naturally uh, colorful. Some of the bacteria are used in NEB to make proteins and they happen to have color too. Um, and there are also recombinant E. coli where chromogenic proteins are expressed to make different colors. So these are our kind of paint brushes. And another question I always get is why do bacteria have color? And that's a deep question because you have to imagine that bacteria invented color before the invention of sight. So for billions of years, there was color on this planet, but there was no animal that could see it. So it's not for the beauty, but they have uh, each color, each chemical dye has their own uh, purpose. Usually it's to uh, fight stress or a hormone or a signaling molecule, and it has a complicated path, but they make these beautiful colors. And here are some examples of bacteria with color whose colors have been identified and studied. One cool paper I once bumped into was this color, uh, blue color made by Streptomyces. And here at the top right, you could see the picture of the Streptomyces growing, and you can see these blobs of beautiful bright blue colors that are made by the mycelium that are in this bacteria. And these researchers wanted to know what this blue color was and they discovered it and they found out it's actually a pretty good antibiotic. But in their paper, I believe they wrote, this research began because the bacteria were beautiful, not because they were looking for an antimicrobial uh, chemical. And bacteria not only have these beautiful colors, but they also make these excellent shapes that are very unpredictable and are really fun to work with. So when you work with bacteria, it's not, you're not fully in control of your art. It's kind of a collaboration between the paint and the artist. <clears throat> you may draw in one way, but bacteria will decide to grow in another direction. And they also communicate with each other. They're sending out signals. So some might inhibit each other, some might promote growth. So this is all very fun to do. And you're kind of watching the whole process, even though you're making it. 
If you want to know more about all this, there's a YouTube video that you can see here where we briefly explain how we make bacterial art using R. So let's get to the, the pretty pictures. Here are some of the early works of Maria. This is when she started using uh, bacteria to make different things. In the middle, you can see a dragonfly. I found the dead dragonfly, and you can just put it on agar, and it'll just grow on itself. So you don't naturally have to manipulate the bacteria. But if you do manipulate them, wonderful shapes can come out. And here are some uh, paintings of hers that looks like flowers. And here's another one that we like a lot. It reminds me of the Japanese Zen style of deep brushes. So each one can come out in a different way. Here are some sea creatures. And what I really like about this work is, now that I'm very familiar with Maria's art, I can see her wood etchings and her auger art being very, very similar. And one great example of that <coughs> is her drawings with brain. She's actually pretty obsessed with brain. She has a lot of wood carvings of brain. And years later, similar patterns emerge with uh, bacterial art, which is very fantastic. We've also been approached by companies to make art for their web pages or their, uh, their uh, marketing programs. And one company that was making uh, drugs using microbial growth, I don't remember exactly what, wanted us to make a gut drawing. So here she, she made a couple of sketches where you see the bacteria and the epithelial cells of our gut and the ducts and the capillaries. And like I said, here's one where you would just take natural substrates, like keys, coins, you could take a leaf from a plant and just put it on. And you could also go uh, very random patterns. You don't have to draw anything. You can just throw different kinds of bacteria on there and they'll naturally make really great patterns. Here's one where she just randomly rolls some uh, glass balls containing bacteria on agar. And sometimes these uh, guests, they just, we let them grow, see what happens, and they turn into these massive blooms. And this one called La Luna, and even when they dry off and they die, they still end up looking very pretty, just naturally growing on an agar plate. So you really don't have to be an artist. I think these one were uh, done by sticking agar to her daughter's belly button. So you can see just on your skin, there are all sorts of bacteria that are grown. And sometimes, she adds uh, food coloring dyes to the agar to make interesting different types of uh, color and visuals. She also made collages using different picture dishes put together to make one big image. Uh, we then said, like Lafarge, what would it look like if we could see the bacteria on our face? And so we bought a face mask, poured agar into it, and she decorated it with bacteria. And here is exactly what Lafarge would see on the left if you had that visible. Our faces would be a jungle of bacteria, and it would not look like the way it is looking when we see each other today. And so we started doing playing with molds, you know, making little agar molds. Um, we started putting agar on top of things and then started sealing it with epoxy. Uh, one day we were uh, researching on antibodies in bacteria and Maria asked, what are you guys working on? And I told her antibodies and how they fold. And then a week or two weeks later, she comes up with this beautiful uh, drawing or microbial growth of antibodies and represented by these copper wires. Here they represent alpha helices and beta sheets. And she then started plugging other chunks out of previously made other and then putting them together in kind of a three-dimensional shape. And here's another one, her work for Boston Bacterial Meeting, where they wanted to make a, they wanted us to make an art piece for them. So you can see the skyline of Boston there, and these are some of her works. And then it all changed in 2015. So we began around 2011. For a few years, we were um, just doing hobby kind of work. We were hoping that we'll do a local gallery, and that's about it. But in 2015, uh, ASM began the first other art contest. So we submitted our pieces. And to my big surprise, we won the first place. And we won the people's choice, the most popular uh, people with these two works of art. And that drastically changed our life. From being a local, cute collaboration, it turned into an international success. Before you knew it, I was all over the place. And we were being invited to give uh, TEDx talks and uh, Yep, we were giving TEDx talks in, in Chicago. 
I found our, uh, an article in Natural, uh, National, Geography, National Geographic in Indonesia. And we started getting covers of uh, scientific journals. Uh, my hero, Ripley's Believe It or Not, even asked us to submit work for them, and it was in their book. And one of my favorite pieces is this one that, again, we won an award for in 2018. And in this one, what Maria did was she took a large auger plate and she pressed it against her breast and isolated bacteria. So the bacteria around her nipple area were different than the bacteria around the skin, showing the different ecosystem. And some of the bacteria were pink. So she isolated that pink bacteria and you could see the shape she made of the breast. You can see the mammary glands here and that pink actually came from her own skin. And then again, like I said, she pressed it on her daughter's belly button and isolated the bacteria from there. And she drew a, a placenta with a uterus in there. And then she put a string connecting them, showing the microbial connection between the mom and the daughter, which I think is wonderful. And it's one of my favorite pieces. And then, like I said, we were asked to make a commission piece for Boston Bacterial Art. This is made from a contamination with food coloring from different plates. And it takes a long, long time for her to get one final piece done. And obviously, we started going out to the public because we really want to tell the message to people. So we started giving show talks at galleries, at museums. We got invited to conventions. Uh, we love reaching out to junior scientists. So we give back to our workshops, not only in universities, but also in high schools. And our work has been in, uh, in galleries and uh, museums all over the world. So we're very, very happy. This one was a, one of the largest science centers in the USA. And uh, there is also a book, uh, Life at the Ed Edge of Sight, that I would strongly recommend. We've been on a Discovery Channel um, uh, documentary that hasn't been released yet. I am in the process of right now finishing a bacterial art manuscript, which I hope to put online. So a lot of people are coming out to me. Just a few days ago, a high school uh, teacher in Italy reached out to, make, to me to make bacterial art with her students. So that kind of brings up to the last part of my talk, which is where are we going with this? Obviously, last two years due to COVID, things have halted, but we have dreams to continue. One dream of mine is to show the dynamic beauty of bacteria. A lot of our work is just static, you know, the final picture, the final artwork, but bacteria change over time. So to do that, I, we invented a chamber called Mocha that you can make animation. So here you're looking top down to a beaker full of liquid and we inoculated bacteria and it's growing. And is it moving? Ah, the movie is not working. I don't know why, but it was gonna show you the, um, and here's another one. So this is the bacteria growing over time. And this here is on the right is an hour. So that's like 30 hours right there. And this uh, animation here won us the prestigious facet by our competition. And one of my dreams in bridging the gap between science and art is to view science as art and view art as science. And when we print, uh, published the work on this time-lapse animation chamber, it got published in a prestigious scientific journal. And this journal tells you how to take, um, uh, this paper shows you how to make animations with bacteria. And it was a scientific publication with no scientific uh, information in there. It's just a technique paper. And when we were in a gallery exhibiting our work, I managed to hang this scientific work in a gallery as a work of art. So I'm very proud of that too. And then I teamed up with Jasmine at Bouquet Lab in NYU and she does yeast art. So she can print different yeast using a machine and each yeast having different color will replicate the image. So I gave her these three famous images that everyone is familiar with and she converted them to a lower resolution image so that she can print them. And then she printed them exactly using yeast. So the column on the very right is just living yeast. And that's really nice. But then I wanted to make an animation. I was like, this is great, Jasmine. We can print whatever we want. Let's make an animation. And then, so I came up with the idea that we should make an animation of the Sistine Chapel with God. And instead of uh, Adam, I said, screw man, men are not popular. Let's put Eve's finger there. And that animation was to have God and Eve touch their fingers together. And upon touching a bloom of life occurs. And so I hope this animation works. So what you're seeing is about four or five different prints of yeast. 
stitched together to make an animation. And as far as I know, this is the world's first microbial animation. And now I have dreams of you know, furthering this and making a bit more detailed animation. All right. So I am in the progress of making a manuscript for uh, using bacteria to make art. I hope I'll complete that soon. Uh, we really want to know how they interact with each other because we want to know if they inhibit or if they uh, cooperate together so we can understand our work. And you could actually see some of it here. See, there's a guest here. You can see that the color around it is changing and it's interacting. And we have fantasies of making jewelry using bacterial art. Um, I've talked to a few companies to make kits so that people at home or in school can make bacterial art. And uh, we have thoughts about assimilating electronic circuitry with bacteria to make a kind of a cyborg bacterial art. But today, bacterial art is really vast. What began uh, 11 years ago with very few people, today is a very popular form of art. So if you write bacterial art, you'll find lots and lots of different forms and people. But you know, bacterial art is also not new. Uh, these cave paintings about 5,000 years ago in Northwest America have these red dyes, and they actually are red because of a bacteria, but to remain red all these years, the bacteria had to be cooked to about 750 degrees, not higher and not lower. So the people about 5,000 years ago knew what they were doing, and they were manipulating bacteria, though they probably did not know it was bacteria, to make these cave paintings. And bacteria actually began officially in 1933 with Sir Alexander Fleming, because he was uh, actually a pretty good artist, and he also loved the bacteria. And he started drawing paper um, figures on a piece of paper that he would embed its solution and paint over it with bacteria. And this is the first bacterial art that I'm aware of. And the queen, when she saw it, was not amused. Um, but it is said that, I'll skip that. Yeah, so. What began with Sir Alexander Fleming is a large community today. There are a lot of scientists who make art using bacteria, mainly because they have access to a laboratory and all the things you need to work with them safely. But there are also many artists who don't have scientific training that do a lot of bacterial art. And I kind of want to finish off with the famous words of Thomas Steitz. I was actually flying to the University of Kentucky to give a talk on bacterial art when I read this obituary and uh, he got the Nobel Prize for discovering the ribosome. And in that article, it said, you know, I could do music as a hobby, but I could not do science as a hobby. And that's exactly why I chose the path of science, because I always knew I could do art at the side, but I, no one can do science at the side. It's very difficult. And he also said, it's not just being a great scientist, it's also being a great artist. So he understood the value of art. And if you talk to scientists, many scientists will agree with that though not many can have the time or the interest to pursue and merge those two. So I want to finish off with you to the junior uh, scientists out there. You will all be senior scientists one day in key positions. So when the opportunity comes, please take the time to merge the fields of art and science. Take the courageous step. Don't be afraid. And you'll be, short, you'll be sure to be rewarded. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, more than happy to start a discussion. Thank you.